security, so greenhouses and that kind of thing for this class. And how did you hear about us? Lynn Skull, the director of the Cuesta Economic Development Fund. Nice, nice, great. Thank you. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Shane Bender. Uh, I have the office of property over there in uh, Florida, up around Picos. Mm -hmm. And that's where we graze most of the time. We also graze in the summer in the ski valley with Mr. Edmino. Nice. And now in Cerro Asu. But we're trying to grow our herd and better our clientele. And like Mr. Mosbach Edmonds was saying, cut out the middle now yep. and go direct into the grocery store. And All right, let's read this. So the cross going to be, and, <laughs> and it's, I, think, I think it's healthier and everything for the community as in general. And Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. So I just want to learn more about the fruit. And how did you hear that? Email. Email, okay. Um, Bruce Bermudez. Uh, here on the reservation, and I did a lot of farming out there. Now I farm at volunteer at Red Willow, and then on Off Forgotten Mountain. I was there during when we first got the 70 acres right across from Sid's Food, but I left for about two years, so I just started back up for the past couple months. Nice. And yeah, just interested in um, trying to help promote food security. You know, less, nice. less stuff from California, Mexico, more stuff here and as well. I'm into hydro, aqua, I study the work. These are all places we're going to get together. How did you hear about this? Uh, I was actually at Tractor Supply picking up some uh, chains. Right flyer. Now. Interesting. <laughs> flyers <laughs> work. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, right. everyone. Because that, that really helps us and it, I'm sure it helps you guys to understand why people are here. So, right. we've got some pre planned questions and then we'll open it up for discussion. Alrighty, I think we'll just jump right in. Thank you so much, Eli, and thank you so much, Felix, for being here this evening. We really appreciate your time. Um, so, our first question for you is about consumer demand. So, Eli, we'll go ahead and start with you. Would you say that there is consumer demand for Albertsons to carry local meat? I believe so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get um, every day um, from people, you know, if there's local um, meat available, um, you know, I can't try to tell them, you know, I mean, there's nothing going on right now, um, but I mean, as far as, um, you know, customers wanting it, right. like, I, every, every single week it's, it's something that we encounter, so. Interesting. Yes, I think it would be really good if we could get some more. Yeah. And what specifically are people requesting? Um, they're pretty much just basic stuff, you know, the pork lamb. Okay. Um, pork lamb. You know, I'm sure they'll go for more, more exotic stuff. I mean, this is house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, just with the customer base, I mean, we get locals and tourists. So, um, you know, depending on what they want, but I think everything would, would go. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Felix, would you mind talking a little bit about the local produce that SIDS currently carries and the other types of local produce that are in demand? So, right now we carry uh, microgreens mm -hmm. from Taos. It's called the Lady Chris Farms. Uh, and then you started growing mushrooms. So, you have like golden oysters, purple, and <coughs> We carry uh, sprouts from Santa Fe, and then we carry salads from a school in Santa Fe right now. Great. And what's in demand is like, so like a lot of people like local produce. And the reason we can't do it is because we're finding like, greenhouses and it costs a lot of money. 
but locals do like lettuces grown here in Taos, uh, spinach, uh, green leaf, red leaf, romaine. So if that's possible to grow, that'd be nice. Right. For our customers. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Felix. Um, so our next set of questions is about challenges associated with local food. So um, Eli, we'll go back to you. What is the biggest reason as to why Albertsons does not currently carry local meat? Um, so for this question, um, it kind of, kind of goes along with the third um, question. Is um, no suppliers. Okay. Um, the reason that, well, I shouldn't say the reason. Along with the third question, it's, there's rules that go along with it. Right. So I mean, um, Albertsons needs um, certain things, and this is um, <coughs> what every, um, I guess, supplier that we deal with has to deal with. So it's uh, the total trackability of that product. I mean, they need to know exactly where it's coming from. You know, so um, with that, you know, being involved, I guess, they also need insurance coverage, and it's a business. Um, it's got to be with the inspected, which it would be, I'm sure. Um, and just bought from a, a reputable establishment. I mean, I think it would basically bring their guys down here and check out the, the farming situation and, um, you know, see how that goes. But, uh, but with the suppliers, I mean, that's... That's pretty much why we don't carry it. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, Felix, would you say that you experience any challenges with carrying local produce? Yeah, the main challenge is quality, of course, and mm -hmm. then just the shelf life. I think. Because we have to have it at least three to four days quality so we can sell it to our customers. And sometimes it turns fast and we just throw it away. Makes sense. So that's the biggest issue. <laughs> Great. Um, Vicky, do you want to have any questions? Um, that was the last event. <laughs> yep. Okay. You um, answered two questions within one, so <laughs> both of you did. The last one? Um, no, we got a few more, just very few. So um, this was this is for a produce manager. So could both of y'all talk about this one, or have you ever done produce in our? Okay. So this will be for Felix again. So what are the requirements for the produce to be sold at SIDS? At SIDS? The regulatory, I'm thinking. Yeah. So since the food market has set aside time each week to purchase local produce. And call in advance so you can bring in samples. And then, um, so when you do bring it in, we check quality, of course, based on the standards we have set up. And the pricing depends on the market prices and quality. And it's up to the manager to pay for for the produce. So I, so basically, so if you come to me and say you want four dollars, and I say three, either take it or or leave it because I got to make money on it too for the yeah right for the store for the customers have to mm -hmm. and, and also buy that as a reasonable price. If the produce meets the standards, we will we will buy it from you and we will sell it to our customers. So, so uh, are you talking about stamp like USDA standards? No, you're on the in store. Yeah, in store standards. Okay. And if you do want to sell USDA, organic, of course. Organic, you got to bring your paperwork, right, and, and all that good stuff with it. Yeah. Okay. So basically, local is just pesticide free. Okay. And what do they have to do to prove that? Uh, basically, we just take their word for it. <laughs> <laughs> that may change. You never know. Yeah, it would be <laughs> nice if we could get some kind of proof, but yeah. But as of right now, it's just trust. Okay. okay. All righty. Thank yeah. you. And then the last question is the same thing for you, Eli, only about meat. Now, what are the requirements for the meat that's offered at Albertsons? Um, so, like I said before, just the USDA um, certification. Um, anything organic, of course, uh, has to 
have the organic natural. Um, so what Altus does is they, they buy from um, their suppliers now, which is IBP, um, what else, Excel, um, can't think of that last one. So they, these uh, people supply to them and you know, that's, they, they set the standards, which is pretty much what I've been over before, you know, the, the insurance, right. the trackability, um, that's a big thing. I mean, food safety nowadays, you know, it's, it's, it's huge, so that's right. one big thing that they want to be able to do. All right. Well, okay. appreciate it. So then the, the big question of the night, and this is where we're going to open it up for everybody, is um, how can grocery stores and towns work with local ranchers and farmers to increase access to local food? So we'll let you two have the first word on that, and then they can start asking questions. If you want to have the first word. <laughs> so I think if, if the ranchers can, can provide of course what these companies standards are um, there would be no problem I mean um, and I wish I had more information on this but when I first got here I've been running the, the Alton's market for 20 years mm -hmm. and I first got here there was a section in the frozen a section of the, the meat market and there was <laughs> um, crowd back you know I guess steaks uh, there was even some ostrich in there I mean just different varieties so um, it, it had to have happened before you know I just I just <coughs> like I said I'm sorry I can give more information about what what was going on there but as far as any of the rules it's comply with with uh, what Altsense is doing I mean it's a little more strict than SIDS you know just um, taking the word for it so it, it, I mean I see no problem after that you know it, it'd be a really really good thing for cops. Yeah. Hey, Mike, can I jump in and, and ask how you guys purchase beef or, or pork? Is it in size? Is it, what is it that you guys get in? You guys do your own cuts in house, correct? Yes. You can buy in size? No, we do uh, box beef. Box beef? Yeah, and it comes in primes, which is basically just a large part of a section off animal. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and, and like I said, it's just coming from, from those suppliers. Uh, I think uh, nationals of yeah. So reasoning for, for that question, guys, is for you guys that are, are processing, you guys won't have to pay a cut and rack fee because these will be boxed and there'll be chunks of beef. You're not going to be paying, you know, uh, to cut the beef up into all the beef cuts and stuff, you know. So, that, so that's a savings for you guys because sometimes we have to take into consideration how much Albertsons is going to pay you for that beef mm -hmm. versus what uh, Antonio's restaurant can pay for the beef because he already needs the steaks cut. He already needs you know, the rack of lamb. He already needs those specialty cuts, and these guys don't. So sometimes we have to keep those things in mind when we're already getting really ready to sell. You know, and that it's a lot more in in the meat side of things. And mm -hmm. before we go on into questionings, and once we give Felix an, an opportunity, I'm gonna kind of step in and give you a little bit of direction on on what the mobile Matanza will be looking at and how we would be working, okay? okay. So thank you, Eli. Okay, Felix. Uh, work together just, just with the farmers to be honest with me, especially because like I said before, it's all trust and honesty. And as far as beef with SIDS, it's all USD. It has to be USD. Great. Is there any question about the food safety certification or food safety plan, anything like that? No. no. In the produce? Yeah, yeah, not the produce. Okay. Great. Well, that's all the questions I have. If you do have any. No, that's. Okay. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank and welcome True Kids One, which I didn't acknowledge, and so they are here videotaping, you know, taking photographs and really helping us get the word out. I'd like to give them a round of applause because these guys are doing great. We've got one of them on the floor over here taking some pictures, and we've got another one behind there. So, you guys want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Isaiah Duran. I'm one of the students of P. Greenrow, and he just 
it does create jobs. Great. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, there you go. Oh, How about you, Kim? Why is all the equipment we need to do to do all this? Whoa. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. So, my name is Andre Sanchez, and um, I'm also part of Troop Group 1, and this is actually a coincidence because, um, well, my father was supposed to come to this meeting, but... You know, he was one of the panelists. Yeah, but there was a baby situation. So, yeah, and so, um, and so, yeah, so I just wanted to, you know, this is the room. Great. Well, thank you. I'll take the praise. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, True Kids One, for being a part of our event. Thank you for allowing us to come here. You're, you're welcome. We, we appreciate it, and we can take any and opportunity. Thank you, Vicky. Victoria. <laughs> Victoria was, yes, our connection here, so yes. we thank her as well. And Ronia is in the back there. She came late. She wanted to hide. She <laughs> came photographs as well. We're actually going to, so we're putting together a couple short documentary films. Uh, that we're going to screen at an event in uh, on May 24th at the TCA called The Future of Our Food. So we're working on a little docu short documentary video about cattle as food. We're going to interview Robert Martinez. Uh, we're going to interview these gentlemen here as well, and uh, Mercedes another day. Um, and uh, yeah, so please look out for flyers and join us on May 24th. Uh, we have other student video projects that are going to be screened all around this topic of the future of our food. Great, thank you, thank you. So again, in, in wrapping up with, with the presentation from Albertsons and SIDS, I think that the, the bigger scope and the bigger picture to really talk about here when mobilizing this, it's a, a mobile Matanza program, okay? So we're not just gonna be a mobile slaughter unit and we're not just gonna be a meat processing facility, okay? We're, we're a complete package. So part of the training and development for this whole program is going to be able to help you guys market and merchandise your beef. What that's going to mean is that we're going to help you guys get into outlets. So bringing them here is the beginning of this introduction so that you guys can put a, a name to a face. You know, when you hear people's names, then you know, oh, you know, he's the guy at the meat market at Albertsons, you know. He's the produce guy, you know, at, at SIS, and that's who I need to make contact with to get in through that door. The requirements that they talk about to get into their institutions, we're going to help you with. So Eli mentions, you know, needing USDA inspection for your beef. That is the mobile Matanza and the meat processing. They both will have a USDA grant of inspection. So your meat will be slaughtered under USDA grant of inspection, and it will be processed under USDA grant of inspection. Okay? For the produce and the veggie side, we're developing a wash and pack facility here, which is going to be GAP certified. So things will be washed and packed and stored here under refrigeration, under freezer, under dry storage, whatever refrigeration needs you have, whatever storage needs you have. So those GAP certifications, we're going to take that, undertake that for you guys to you to open up doors in the wholesale world for you guys to be able to sell your, your fruits and your veggies, okay? So all of those requirements that they are talking about, we're going to help you meet, okay? That is why I, I stress the word program and project. We're not just a mobile slaughter <coughs> unit. We're not just a meat processing facility. We're a program, okay? And that program needs to make sure that you guys are understanding the regulation that is going to be required for you guys to sell your products, okay? Once we get the, that product in the door, then we have to ensure that you guys are going to have a product to be able to sell, okay? So the regulation that Eli talks about will we'll been there, done that, okay? So that, that is part of the educational component that is going to be part of this program and this project. I think we wanted to kickstart with making sure that you guys understand real life and appreciate that we're going that extra step for you guys and already starting to make the connections, okay? There are projects throughout the state that will purchase your product for institutional needs. One of our biggest projects under, you know, this New Mexico Food Security Grant is that we get local needs into our institutions. 
that's our schools, that's our senior centers, that's our detention centers, and any institution within the state. It's not only with us, okay? Our food center, products that are developed in the food center, you can get as big as you want to get, you can stay as small as you need to be, okay? You, you can grow at a fast rate or you can grow at your own rate, but we will, we will have, we are securing the funds needed to be able to have those things in place to ensure you guys, you know, do become successful. The, the Matanza, you know, when the mobile slaughter unit, you know, there was an article that went out there and it called it a semi-mobile slaughter unit. The reason it's being called a semi-mobile slaughter unit is because now we're going to have the ability to be mobile and we're going to have the ability to slaughter a slaughter unit. From the slaughter unit, it's going to go into a drip cooler. The drip cooler is a cut and wrap. Cut and wrap is a carcass cooler. And the carcass cooler goes out into a big refrigerator freezer combo that will be the distribution site for, for all of the movement. Okay? The units that are being built out are capacity of 50 carcasses. So 50 carcasses can be moved in one, and I'm talking beef, okay? So when we're looking at smaller animals like pork, obviously the capacity goes up. When we talk about bigger animals like bison, because we will be working with the bison programs within the state, it's not only going to be Taos Pueblo. We have a memorandum of agreement already with Taos Pueblo to do the slaughtering for Taos Pueblo and the distribution of their bison program for Taos Pueblo. Picuris is next in line and Sandia is already knocking at the door as well. Okay. So we need to really realize the scope of what we're getting because things are, people are getting antsy on me. Dates, times, when, you know. It takes time, people. You know, we're, we're, we're doing it right, okay? And I think that Mr. Martinez here <coughs> thought that this was Luca Salazar, but who's spearheading this project for us is Luca Salazar. He's of Salazar Meats in Manassa, Colorado. He has been running his own operation for over seven years on his own and was with his father, you know, and it was a family operation for 10 years. And so he's got the slaughter side under his belt. He's got the processing, the distribution, and the marketing all under his belt, okay? We need to emphasize that because we're not starting from scratch, okay? We are not starting and we are not trying to figure out how it needs to be done. We are trying to figure out where to get the money to make the entire project happen, okay? That is, that's where we are at. Right now we are calling this a three-phase project. First phase, we have two units secured already. Those of you who have been attending the rancher listening sessions have found out that we have two units secured thanks to the New Mexico Food Security Grant. We've got a cut and wrap facility that again has the capacity of up to 50 carcasses and we have a carcass cooler that is, is ready to go. Those units need to be here and in place before the end of June. So we're at the county, you know, pushing buttons and probably making enemies, you know, to try and put pressure on people to, to get those units here. That money needs to be expended. You know, that those units are ready to ship and we need to pay for them to get them here. A stem wall needs to be built for those units to be received here in Taos. So the stem wall is how these things are going to get connected. The town has been gracious enough to grant us five acres out by Landfill Road. Okay, we're going to be leasing land for them until we secure funds to purchase those five acres which the town is willing to sell. Okay, there's all sorts of money trickling down the pipeline right now. We're at the right place at the right time and you guys are right with the right people. Okay? You guys are where things are going to happen. You guys are where the ability is there for us to be able to tap into federal funds to make things happen. Okay? The reason we want you all here is because we need your input. Okay? So these questions and these handouts that you guys have been given, I need them back so that I can get information from you. We took your information. You know, we don't share information with anybody. That information is for us to keep communication with you because if you have a question, we want to make sure we're on top of it and getting back to you with those questions, okay? So the, the mobile Matanza 
program, again, is going to come with facilities, with assets, and with education. Okay? We're going to have marketing sales. We're going to have the, the whole package for you guys. Some of you are already there. Okay? Some of you may just need the processing facility, you know, and you've got everything in place. Okay? Some of you may already have outlets that you guys sell to. Well, we'd like to help you expand those, okay? The reason I wanted to point out how Albertsons purchases their beef is because there is savings there because you don't have to do the specialty cuts the way you would for a restaurant, okay? When we start dealing with the farm to school, you know, and the lunches for the entire school district, you know, they're not going to buy it in little small packages, Okay, you guys are going to be able to provide big packages, you know, ground beef in maybe 10, 20 pounds. We don't, we don't have to sell in one pound packages. Thus, that is the savings for you guys because you guys won't have to pay, you know, to package, you know, each individual pound of meat. Okay, so those are the things that we need to, you know, make sure you guys understand, you know, where that savings is going to is going to come, okay? So a lot of people think that because you're going to sell to an institution, because there's only about $4.20 for every children's lunch that we provide over there, that you guys are not going to be able to get paid, you know, good money for your product, and that is wrong. That local meal to your institutions. So that project here through the legislative session was just awarded $3.2 million dollars. You know, and that, that's for the state. Not everybody taps into it. Here in our county, not every program taps into New Mexico ground. Not every school uses those dollars. Our senior center doesn't use those dollars. Well, by golly, we are educating and we are training the people to be able to know how to tap into these state funds. You know, there, there are funds out there. Food security is a big concern within our state. Our state is taking it seriously and is taking measures to be able to fix food insecurity within our state. It is up to us as nonprofits and it is up to you guys as providers of this local meat, this local fruits and veggies to step up to the plate, to help us source locally, and to ensure that whatever is being produced stays locally, okay? If you have more than you need outside of your county and you can sell outside, by all means. You know, that that is the goal, okay? So with all that, then I'll open it up to you guys for questions for, for any of us. <laughs> and I wanted, I wanted to add one more thing, too, that... We're going to, we're planning another discussion like this. We're in the process right now of interviewing restaurants and their purchasers as far as meat and produce, just local. So we're in the process of interviewing now and then we'll uh, recruit <laughs> some panelists. And um, so just watch it. We're going to hear about stuff. Watch it because probably about two months we'll have another one of these and it'll be on the restaurant buyers. Local, all local. I want to for you. Well, um, you mentioned that Albertsons buys from these big suppliers, I guess, they're national ITP and sell. Um, so where does a you know, where does a single developer, single producer of beer and cows fit into that system where Albertsons, you know, like is used to seeing things come from a giant national supplier? Yeah, I think. Um, <clears throat> In just being local is 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 a draw that way, you know. Um, it's, it's not going to be, you know, as as big as yeah, like IBP. I mean, that's where we get most of our our stuff from. But um, well, I should just ask, um, can I sell you some lamb right now? Well, yeah, you know, I've got lamb, you know, you know I'm more. So that's the kind of question. Do you, do you make buy, do you make purchasing decisions on local meat in Albuquerque? Um, so what I do, I, I do the ordering. Um, purchasing decisions like Felix does at SIDS, I don't do that. Um, it's it's we're connected to you know the, the uh, warehouse in Lubbock, Texas, and they get their meat from uh, well, RV, which is from IBP National Excel. So um, 
if I want to sell, if I want to sell something to others, do I have to talk to somebody, meet somebody in Texas, or is there somebody here in house who would say, oh yeah, you know, you've got you've got a bunch of USDA meat, or you can, and I can have a production schedule. So what I would do is, is refer you to my boss, uh, Eric Fuller in Albuquerque. Eric Fuller. Yes, and he um, will then be able to refer you to someone in Lubbock or you know tell you how the process goes. Um, one thing, it, now that you say the lamb, um, I'm having a real hard time uh, getting the lamb, you know, so it's, it's uh, if, if I could have somebody here, I mean, it would be perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, it, that, that's another thing, too, is it's, it's just the demand is it, it's there, mm -hmm. just from other suppliers that aren't supplying me right now. It sounds like I would have to go through Texas to I'm get sure. new lamb. Yeah. So let me step in on that one. No. So we, we've met with um, supervisors, you and I've talked to Gant, and we've actually made the, the connection. So I don't know if you guys know, but Albertsons was, is going to be part of, of, um, of Smith's, you know, so, so the corporate picture has changed a little bit. But the local connection and the local commitment for local is made through the store supervisors to make the connections to be able to get those in. Like Eli say, it used to happen. It used to. It's not as big a deal as we thought it was going to be. What it really takes is communication. And what it's really going to take is the commitment from the Matanza program to ensure that you are having and that you are meeting their demands. So we're going to have to make sure that you slaughter your lambs under USDA inspection and that you follow the labeling. The traceability is the biggest thing with these, you know, this one huge marketplace now. You know, it, it's traceability. You know, so basically when you own your lambs, we're going to have to be able to, to do gap type orientation, which means you need to know where your water source comes from. How are you, you know, where these animals are drinking from? What kind of pasture, you know, these, these animals are, are pasturing on? You know, those gap certifications for, for a processing facility, you know, are essential to be able to get you into the wholesale markets. The highest standard for a, a sale of any product is to the government. And government is your institutions. That's your schools, that's your senior centers, that's your detention centers. And that's what we're going to have hold you guys accountable for. Whoever processes in that food center may only be selling at the farmer's market, but what they are held for is wholesale standard. Because I, ha I can't have some people processing one fashion and others in another fashion. Everybody has to be held to the highest standard. And so when you come to us and you say you have lamb, then we're going to need laws. You know, we're going to we're going to have to be accountable for what you're bringing to the table, and that's where the education component that I speak to about comes into place. Okay, thank you. So then, you are the education component, I assume. Correct. Um, and then as far as like USDA, USDA level, I assume you would have to inspect the facilities where the livestock's raised. I mean, like, like you said, you need to know where the water source is coming from and all that. Uh, those are laws that you would provide. Okay. You know, so again, I think the only thing that is accountable, you know, like Felix was saying, was organic. So if you're claiming organic, then there needs to be paperwork behind that. Sure. Grass fed, you know, is is grass fed? Where is that grass coming from? Is it an acceptable grass? You know, those aren't questions that fall into any typical USDA inspector law. Right. Okay, so you were bringing what we do test in the facility is E. coli. Right. You know, so you'll be your right. your animals will be tested. You know, so if they get sent out to a lab. You know, and, and those tests are done upon receival of your animals. So the time that they sit here for processing, we would already have results on those animals, making sure that nothing is going out of here with with any disease. Right. Um, so again, it gets back to the education part of that. But we're starting from the ground up. And I mean, we came to this meeting with, I guess the sole purpose for us being here is deciding whether or not we're going to grow 50 pigs to sell a farmer's market. 
or we can go three to five hundred to start, you know, supply grocery stores. <laughs> and so I, I we kind of need the aspect of knowing what is, you know, on the regulations, like where they're kept, things like that. You know, if I need to build buying facilities where they're kept at special or you know, is it just you know normal farm? So there's two types of sales you can have. One is called direct to the consumer. Direct to the consumer means farmers markets. Right. Right? Or you have your neighbor and he's buying from you, okay? And you don't need USDA inspection for that. Right. You know, anything else, retail. So if you're selling to restaurants, if you're selling to grocery stores and to institutions, you know that there needs to be a USDA step behind not only the slaughter, but the process. And so, you know, what, whatever, you know, you sell directly to your consumer is unregulated, really. Right. You know, you basically have to take on the responsibility yourself to have, you know, good manufacturing practices. You know, to know that you're raising, you know, your livestock in a manner that is acceptable for consumption. Right. And so, but, but there is no regulation. No one is going to come and tell you how to do it. USDA is going to regulate certain things, but it does come down to the way you raise them as well. You know, so what we need to be accountable for again is, you know, there was a lot of people, you know, that there was a processing facility not too far from here, and not mentioning any names, that was using sewer water, you know, for for their animals. You know that that's not acceptable. That's not common sense. That's not something that anyone should be doing. You know. Um, did it cause problems? Maybe some did, but most probably didn't. You know, it wasn't until it was exposed publicly that any people even found out. You know, mm -hmm. the people probably didn't even get sick from that. You know, but those are the good manufacturing practices that education comes with. You know, and we're not doing so. We're, we're the project and we're the program, and we're going to bring in the experts to be able to do this. You know, there's Flower Hill Institute. I don't know if you guys have heard of Flower Hill Institute. You know, they're a national, you know, institution that basically is part of this whole meat processing process. And so they have all the experts in, in line. We're already partnering with them to bring them into town to be able to have workshops, you know. We'll have multitude of workshops and you can choose what you want to come to and what you don't, you know. The difference here is that we are not for profit. So us going out and finding money to do these things you know, is the difference, because most of these workshops will be offered to you guys at no cost at all. You know, we need to ensure that we set you guys up for success, not for failure. You know, so you're going to need training on these questions that you have. Once we get trickled through that, you're going to need financial. I don't know how many people I get in that, you know, uh, food center that can make a mean cookie, and they, they'll sell it like that, you know. But then they don't know how much it costs them to produce that cookie. They're set underselling it, so they go under right away. You know, so both hands need to be on the same page, okay? And that's what I mean from beginning to end. You know, and again, by no means am I saying we know it all, we're going to teach it all. Absolutely not. You know, but my commitment has been to this community that I will bring the experts to the table. Uh -huh. and can I interject that with your experience in being here for almost 100 years? Look, um, <laughs> Arminio, do not talk about my age. <laughs> <laughs> but back to you, his question. I think uh, we started, uh, they did, uh, they were instrumental in uh, building up the infrastructure for the mobile contest that took place uh, years ago. 2007. 2007, <laughs> uh, whatever it was. But what they did uh, uh, to uh, to classify it as a, as a USDA inspector, the, the USDA inspector used to go to my place because we started that process with, with, your, with your initiatives. Correct. And they would look at the, um, uh, if I had a two beef or a beef and a lamb, they would look at the animals for the, uh, and it says, uh, where does the beef go? Where did you graze? And they would take notes, USDA, and then uh, let's see, they'd look around in the pre uh, processing the day before. And then they look at the water, and they, they look at all these uh, things that uh, to be able to qualify them, I guess, uh, to, uh, if there was, if they didn't label them grass fed, but they certainly USDA inspected. Correct. And, it, uh, and I said, where did the, where do you graze? Where did they come from? Did you get yourself from here? And he could even look, he was a good USDA inspector, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so he would look at, uh, you know, the things that, in the places that I have, and he 
chances that you had to eliminate this, that, or the other for the next cycle. So it was, we, we were pretty comfortable with working the person that you had yeah. uh, to start out with. So that made a, a big difference in that we were able to process, uh, you know, uh, and uh, that's the reason we extend our hands out to Mercedes simply because uh, she's been in the forefront of this battle. Right. And her, her knowledge and experience is, uh, is, 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 uh, is wealth because I know her and uh, it's, uh, sometimes we don't, uh, we're not on the same uh, page, but uh, she's got the uh, superintendent control. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that knowledge and, and success comes the recognizing of, of failure, you know, and that 2007 project was a failure, you know. It was a pilot program, you know, and I keep reminding you, and it was the second mobile slaughter unit in the nation. And so it was a pilot pro uh, project that we learned from. You know, but, but it was a failure. You know, we basically ran it to the ground. And so my previous administration, you know, I, it was just a failure. And so we've learned from those mistakes. We have you know, built up from those mistakes. And again, we have brought the experts to the table. And that's Lucas Salazar, you know, out of Salazar Meeks. I have a question for Felix. Do you have any advice for how to get um, a, a Swiss chard leaf from my greenhouse onto your shelf without a wilting. So first of all, cold refrigeration and keep it wet. Mm -hmm. So when you take it to me, mm -hmm. it's not wilted. Yeah. And only by wilted stuff. Sure. So. Okay. Um, so can you, can you do that with just that, like a cardboard box and packed ice, or do I need a refrigerated van? Just like, just with ice is good, because that's how they ship it to us. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so you, you mentioned spinach, green, red, um, and romaine. Yeah. Um, are there any other vegetables on top of your list that you would like to have on the shelf? Uh, no, that's it. I'm thinking about leafies, leafy greens. So like leafy greens is... Yeah is number one. Yeah. And of course in summer we get zucchini, squash, mm -hmm. carrots, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. it, but like in the winter, it's the greens. Okay. Is kale one of the greens? Because it's easy to grow. It's easy to grow. Everybody's tailed out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, I know, and I just want to... sell a lot of cow. <laughs> yeah. I wondered if you still do, because it's... So cow, and it would be nice if it came local too. Okay. Kale? Yeah, cow and like uh, a dino cow. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, the other question I have is um, in terms of just budgeting my space in the greenhouse, um, one thing I, I do is I, I walk through you know, your, your shelves and I see all this beautiful stuff. And, you know, like I'm wondering, and this might be proprietary information, but if I see something on your shelf, and if I think, well, I can produce that, I have a shelf life, what percentage of your shelf price, you know, what I think about? And this, this, these are the kind of things I have to make decisions, you know, months in advance yeah. so I can figure out what I'm going to invest time in. So you're talking about, like, the price-wise? Yeah. Like, when buy it from you? Yeah, I see kale on the shelf, yeah. I see $5 for a bunch. Uh, does that mean you're going to buy it for 50% of that, or, or what's the... It's, it sits between 40 and 30, it depends, yeah. 40, 30 percent. So between 30 and 40. Okay, well, that's the whole, your wholesale. Yeah, so we could make money on it. Yeah. Okay, great, that's very helpful, thank you. So, talking about what you're saying on the prices, uh, how do, um, let's say for example, I think in the last month, okay, the wheat of wheat has been up like 60 cents a pound to what it was when it was in October. Yeah. of that here, okay, and, and then like potatoes, I noticed that on, on, a, on a 50 pound bag, they're about $10 from October to what they're now, you know, $10 higher. So on the beef, what, what do you guys see that has gone up so far? On the beef that sits, I'm not really sure, that, but I'm sure, and I think their goal is 30 to 40 also, but to make what you sell to, to 
was. And because I know that these have gone up pretty high in the market, but I don't know if that came from stolen. So you're saying that they're adding or discounting whatever we sell to you by 30% of whatever you see on the retail price. Yeah, so we have to make money out of the course. So we go. So if you buy it from us at $10, you can yeah. make $13. Correct, yeah. Or your markup is. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. So basically, so like in the grocery business, between 25 and 30 is what it should be. That's the for your gross. Yeah, for your gross. Yeah. Add on top of your wholesale price. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had the other way too. Is that a good question? Shoot, it was 50 when I was trying it. So let me ask you, what are you like this? Well, this guy, Pat, has a lot of knowledge because he's got the inventory, the biggest inventory probably in Dallas County, and yet uh, he processes and virtual process a lot of beef, you know, through a lot of different uh, processing plants. Morelli, Las Vegas, uh, Colorado, and so on and so forth. So he would be a good person, uh, this guy behind me, uh, that would be able to give you probably more information. What I was asking, see, from the stockyards to the processing plant, and then to the to you guys, I guess uh, that's what is that uh, at the where you get your twenty and thirty percent? I guess to the consumer, is that what you're saying? Pretty much a process right there, huh? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Because you guys are buying primals, pretty much, right? Yeah. You're buying a whole way by, you're buying a whole round, then you cut it or custom cut it there on site. So uh, our weakness or strength is that um, the. So four packers are really cost effective at cutting and wrapping. And um, you know, we're gonna try and compete, and no matter how hard we try, our processing is gonna be more expensive. So it's a marketing scheme. You have to stay local, you're supporting local ranchers, uh, you, you know, you're able to attract your product to your community. Um, on average, we're about 40 to 70 percent higher than the, the four kill plants. So uh, we're going to run around 1,200 dollars for a live to 1,100 dollars for a live animal to cut and vacuum. Now, if we sell it in primals, it'll probably go to about 800, and then they'll process it. But our margin is small. It's not. There's not a lot of money in it. And so uh, it's going to be a marketing about them supporting local farmers and ranchers. Because if we're going to try and compete the four pit packers, we got a chance. Yeah. It's not even close. I mean, I sell my ground beef for eight sixty a pound. You can go to Albertsons right now and get it for four bucks. You know, so it's a whole different thing. And you can get, you can go um, standard. And then you can go to choice and you can get prime. And even on the rail, prime gives you $330 more a side. So it, it's, um, it's a lot more complex. And really what we're selling is that we're from here and we're local. And you can come see our place. We're not putting Roundup on it. We're not doing that. Don't go put 500 pigs on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> 50 <Thank you>. pigs. <laughs> 50 pigs maybe. And, and it's not as easy as you think. I sell 100 pigs every four months. Uh, but uh, it's not. there's not a lot of margin on it. That's all I'm going to tell you that. And I get waste milk from the Amish and eggs. And they grow like crazy. But the margin is $100 after I process it. So, you know, it, it's really about you being the face of the market. Because you're not going to compete with the big boys. They destroy us. They just got all the things and all the people. And so you bring up that point was why I was going to stick with small, but then we've got processing happening now from Towns County. So I guess the other question I forgot for you was what kind of fees are we looking at for processing? We're, we're all be competitive. I mean, how much are you paying now, Pat? About $1,100 for a 1,350 yeah. pound an animal. And you're going to find out that yeah. people want grass finish, but they want fat. Without fat, you don't have labor. Right? Yeah. So you've got to get a baby. And ground is okay for hamburger and all that. And, and you can reduce your cost for just.
ground beef, you know, killing calves and all that. But then you got to consider yield. Small calves don't yield a lot. You yield the best, and I bet about it. Think about your body when you were the most muscular and most healthy. You're in your 20s. And a seven month old calf doesn't yield a lot. So there's just, I can go on and on and on. I've been doing it forever. And there's the margins. But you, if you get a customer base and they're willing to support us local, that's our niche. And that's where you make your money. Because they realize they're going to be paying us a little more and they're going to charge a little more. But our community is going to go, oh, I know that guy that raises those hogs or that beef or that turkey. Or, and that's, that's what sells. That's why Whole Foods is successful and that's why SIDS is successful. It's a marketing scheme. Okay. I have a question. I'm sorry, I didn't cut you off. That's right. Do you sell bones? I sell everything. Gorgeous, <laughs> tongue, you name it. Heads. Cow heads. Yeah. 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 There are certain communities love it, and goats and sheep. There's a lot of money because we have a lot of Middle Eastern people in the U.S. now, and there's way more money in pigs. I mean, in goats and sheep than there is in beef. It's just a lot more intense because uh, domestic dogs are the number one nightmare period, even for beef cattle. It's not coyotes and all that. It's that dog with a collar on it that runs back to the porch. <laughs> What was your question, Eli? Uh, so I was involved in the mobile Matanza last time. At the beginning? Yes. <coughs> I was one of the starters. And the process uh, uh, with Gilbert, the process seemed to work really good. You know, at the, at the very beginning, the, exactly. the slaughter, you know, the, the hanging, the cleaning, transporting here, getting in here. And then once it got into that holding cooler, it stayed. That, that was a bottleneck. Yeah. You know, that, that was a bottleneck. You know, that's why I stress that the capacity of these new coolers is 50 carcasses. So you know, because that, that was one of our bottlenecks. Yeah, but that wasn't my question. The question is, um, who are, there's only a few cutters in this, this town that know what, how to do what Felix does. You know what I mean? What I do. So, I mean, if the process works great to that point and then there's nobody to cut it, I mean, how's that? Does Lucas have his own crew or? He's, he's hiring out the crew, you know, so he's going to come out and we're looking, you know, but we're going to have a hard time because you guys have a union, you know, and we don't have a union. And so, I mean, the, those are the issues that, that are being faced, you know, and so he does have a crew, you know, and if it came down to it, that's what we're willing to start with. But we want to keep talent local, you know, we don't want to import people, you know, so we, we are partnering with NMSU you know, for a meat cutting program as well. So uh, NMSU is developing a meat cutting program that will go ahead and, and help with the workforce because that there, you're right, that is going to be an issue, you know. There isn't that much, you know, <coughs> workforce here, you know, to be, even within the state, you know, to be able to fulfill. So I think we'll be okay to, to start and to kickstart, but as we grow, we are hoping to tap into, NMSU hopes to have the meat cutting process next spring. So they're already putting the curriculum into place to be able to train. There, there's a lot of students interested out of NMSU in meat cutting, you know, so, so there is gonna be, you know, workforce and there will be, you know, the program for meat cutting. Um, I, don't remember, I don't know if you remember the El Rinto uh, campus, they used to have, yeah. And so a lot of the good meat cutters around the state Unfortunately, you know, we don't recognize talent and they leave the state, you know, and so that that's part of our project and our programs. That's why I emphasize that us being nonprofit is going to be able to give us the ability to, to be competitive because we need to be competitive, you know. We already identified that we can't compete. We can compete with what Albertsons pay you, pays you. We can't compete with with the um, with your views. You know, and, and the benefits of the union could. So, you know, uh, the the process, you know, and what Lucas's plan is for this whole project is investment. So you guys, you know, will have, 
you know, we can't call it profit sharing because we're not for profit. So that it'll be an incentive program. So incentives will be given so that, you know, the workforce, you know, does get recognized. It's hard work, you know, especially on the mobile side. You know, having people outside, you know, in, in the heat or the cold is, is a lot to demand. So there, it has to be incentivized, you know, and so that's how it can be competitive for, you know, the youth side. Yes, I was going to say that as a major problem. Right Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's, there's just not, you know. Yeah. It, it is tough. So, I mean, and again, you know, I, if, if you're willing to, to, we'll take you. I know you, you've you been part of the Matanza, and I appreciate the support you've given the Matanza throughout the years, you know. I mean, it's definitely, you know, again, we, we're going to keep it local, you know, and we want to incentivize. We want to create a good program. It eventually will be a for-profit. It'll be a profit maker, you know. Once we get you guys going, we we'll, can get to the point where we buy beef from you guys, you know. Those of you who are already looking at, you know, growing and you want, we've got a couple of ranchers who want to grow their beef locally. They want to sell their beef locally. But they don't want to do anything. It's like those of you who grow carrots, you know, you're growing. You don't want to sell. You don't want to be out there at the farmer's market. So you want somebody to buy those from you and go sell them for you. You know, that's what we're willing to do, you know, and so basically, again, competitively priced, you know, to be able to get it into our, our um, institutions, you know, our schools and what have you. Yes, she's been waiting for <laughs> um, So what if my neighbor, Reno here, um, wrangles more sheep than I can and races me to the mobile butcher uh, thing? You know, is it, how are you guys... It, does he just, is it first come, first serve, and how is there fair chances with the little guys versus, you know? So it is first come, first serve. You know, we have identified a couple of flaws in that already. You know, there's with the processing that is happening, because people are scheduling out right now for a year, you know, and so people getting five, six, seven, ten slots at a time is not fair. You know, so we, we do have to, you know, give that a little more. And it has to be a policy. There has to be a give and take. You know, yeah. so if we're offering, you know, the, the process and we're offering, you know, I think there has to be a cap. You know, there has to be, you know, you can only process X amount of animals at a time right. and then get back in line. Yeah. You know, that's the only fair and competitive way to do it. There's nothing, you know, Pat again, you know, is probably the biggest grower here, you know, and what have you. He probably would beat you to the ball, you know, and say, I have, you know, yeah. 500, you know. But that would be but, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Now, the, the things that have been thrown out at the ranchers listening sessions is the formation of the co-op. So you guys have a co-op. I know Pat is part of the co-op, but not everybody is. Okay, and so there has been a lot of questions about this, you know, co-op, the, the Rio del Norte co-op, and I have asked uh, Micah, you know, to come and present about that and to really open it up to everyone, but guess what, if that doesn't happen, then you guys create a co-op, you know, I'm meeting with a co-op expert, you know, to be able to, to inform me what the best decision for TCDC to make would be is if we should start a co-op ourselves, you know, for these beef that are going to be purchased, you know, from different ranchers to play locally. So, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy, again, to bring these experts to the table and to help them inform you. There's pros and cons to a co-op, and you just have to put them on the scale and weigh them out. You know? You know? I'm going to ask, you know, uh, you guys come from, uh, uh, actually, meat cutters in the Padillas as well, because I know those, uh, I know, I think one of your relatives uh, did uh, a cutting for me, uh, you know, I use that. But uh, there's a lot of uh, skilled individuals that are retired, uh, like Tomas Lajek and some other individuals, uh, David Martinez and so on and so forth, that are willing to, to get into the, into the uh, uh, cut and wrap process. Okay. And, uh, you know, so, so I think that may be, it just opened the door for you, and I know that Padillas are, are, are good at that as well. Right. So, and uh, I guess uh, she might, uh, you, you guys might be hired. Because, uh, <laughs> But uh, it's, it's about working together and finding that talent. And it's out there. Right. I know that you guys are good because I know the Salazar's have been in that uh, profession almost forever. Like, well, that's why I'm here. I wanted it to succeed back then. You if know. they were boxing, if they were boxing, they were cutting meat, right? <laughs> 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 and 
Yeah. And that's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> So I would suggest that even with uh, what we're doing is we walk, and I think everybody eventually will be welcome into the co-op, but what I'm going to tell you is when you get in the co-op, you pay. Because yeah. they're going to do the marketing, they're going to have a, a, a scheme, they're going to do the advertising and all that. If you can develop a direct market for yourself with reputation, you're going to put more money in your pocket. That's just how it works. Let's clarify the co-op, though. It doesn't have to be outside of your own organization. Right. You know, you can be owner co-op. You know, it, it's stakeholder co-op. You don't have to pay anybody. You just have to find the talent within your co-op to feed back into. Well, some Here, of the here's benefits. some of the benefits for a co-op. You know, numbers. Let's right. say Albertson tells you, we need 20 beef a week. Who has the 20 beef a week? It's going to take two, three, four, or five of you to get those 20 beef a week to be able to meet their demand, you know. And so the, that's the schools. You know, the schools will be, you know, one of those challenges as well. But again, there's pros and cons. You really have to put them on a scale and decide if that's what you want to do. Right. It's definitely not for everyone. They're specializing, I think, is really good, like, where she's talking about the institutions and the schools, and they can support them that way. And then um, individually, if you can, they're going to process, they're going to be USDA, that's the service they're going to provide. If you build a market for 20 labs or 50 pigs every year and you're putting $500 in your pocket for every pig you sell, then you're starting to make money. Then it, it's not just a hobby. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the institutional thing, they're in it. The community, the mayor, everybody's going to support. So that, and it's going to sound weird. But that tends to be your audience stuff, the, the cow, the bull that you grind up and sell your 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 high end stuff. You guys don't buy. Um, you guys buy well in your window case. You buy what choice or better? Yeah, yeah, yeah choice or better. Now choice costs more. I'm gonna say that right now. I don't sell anything but choice because I've learned the hard way that as soon as I do, I lose a customer. So I have to go for the high, at least choice or better, otherwise yeah. they don't come back. No, you don't they have really to have don't want those There is in one place, you're not only going to sell to one place, yeah. so you have to open up anywhere else. about how that scenario works. There's a lot of co-ops, and they have a definite positive place. But, you know, it's this service, if we can ask for the service they're talking about now, that's gold. They can sell to the schools and the institutions, the prisons, then we all know where some, and then you guys, each, everybody, you know, it's a little niche to make a little better money. And, and uh, this local one, as long as it's going through their plan, you can retail it anywhere. And that's, that's what you want. Well, I mean, there's not a lot of money. Yeah. You've got to be massive. We had Paula first. Did you have oh, a No, I was just going to add to that and then to answer your question in regards to the bigger rancher farmer type who has the bigger herds to go and, and get first come first served in the mobile Montana. But then from what Pat was saying, if we have that demand, well say for instance he doesn't because he's already has all his other uh, customers, he might not have that demand that, that's required. So that's where can get these guys to come up and we start our own butcher shop, you know? I mean, it, it, yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, nobody's complaining to anything, you know? So, everyone will benefit, so they won't skip out, you know? So, Virgil. Uh, you know, now that you're talking about things like the TV says down, when you're small, and this thing, other ones are bigger with animals, we need to help the small ones. Yeah. Because if we don't help the small ones, the program will fail right there. Yeah. You know, the small ones are the ones that pick up the people. <coughs> and and the, the, yeah, there's going to be no preferential. We've got to be very honest when we're running these programs because I think that the big ones take advantage of the small ones. And that happens all over here. Yeah. For Inquesta, in, in, for example, in Cuesta, let's talk on that community to get more forward. Yeah. But they're always picking on the small ones. The big ones are. Don't let the small ones no, come in. It's got to be fair and equitable. And the thing is that on the other side, let's say on hamburger meat, like the schools, 
and then steaks or whatever. I'm going to be dealing with livestock. How are you guys going to deal with those orders? Because they take more. We're not. So basically, you know, the, you guys are your own businesses. Okay. Yeah, no All we're providing is a service for you guys. So you guys are going to bring your beef. If you don't have a buyer for your beef, then I'll help you find one. But if you guys are already selling to the school, if you guys are already selling to SIDS, if you guys are already selling, that it's your business. You guys are making. All we're providing is a service for you guys. We're providing a program for you. But we, we don't own a thing. We won't take an order because we've got, we've got nothing to sell. And that's uh, the reason these uh, two individuals are, uh, you know, they need to be part of this equation. Because uh, I know that uh, Masamara is from uh, the sheep herder, uh, Felix, that sells to you guys, and uh, he's making uh, money. And then, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Donald Martinez, they also have <coughs> lamb and so on and so forth. So, and these people are making money. He said, I never made so much money until now that I'm selling to restaurants and so on and so forth. And I know that since it's been up front, and thank you, and we want you guys to, to be part of this with Albert. So now that they join that big business, so if they have good managers, we can work with them, you know, because uh, some of them are very flexible. And they want to have a USD label, best or whatever it is, a label that it's local. And you'd be surprised that the consumer is, is uh, you know, ready to, to buy uh, uh, Absolutely. the local, local. Uh, beef here. And uh, these guys have the inventory, I, I, uh, what's pad and virtual, and well, they have the, the numbers. And thank you very much, because I only have a few, and he's got uh, a bunch of them. And so does Pat. But uh, this is a. Uh, that we can be part of the program. Don't the step on the middle of the table. Don't leave us behind. Thank you for the balance. Keep that scale balance. You gotta remember that the average rancher in the whole United States has 40 cows. That's it. If I had every animal sold, I couldn't even supply opportunities for myself. So there's plenty of room. Plenty of room. It's, you know, that 32% of our beef comes from New Zealand, Australia, or Brazil. 90% of the hamburgers that go to Wendy's, McDonald's, those are all old cows that come from somewhere else. A lot of dairy cows. Dairy cows that can't even stand up. It's a whole different scheme of what we're talking about. And there's lots of room as long as we can market and support each other. Yeah. I couldn't supply them. I don't have a hundred ready every day. No chance. Yeah. I might have ten ready every month. But come on. So you know, that's how it works. But you gotta understand something now so fast that McDonald's at one time had the, the butchery plan out in California. They were going through a million pounds of hamburger meat a day. But what were they buying? They were buying cows with pink eye, bad lemurs, nothing yeah. but junk. Yeah. But the people realize that. But the thing is that now with uh, our program here on our advertisement, you know, there's a 700 pound gap that some people might want better than a 900 pound gap, you know, because, and that's what people that's what are looking for. It's all in their mind. And we've got the market here for that. So that's what we're going to get, you know, because. In Colorado, they got the schools, they got the penitentiaries, they got the hospitals. That the state is doing that program for them to butcher those livestock. Yeah. But that's being run by the state somehow. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if New Mexico is doing that. If New Mexico is doing that. That's why I tell you, there's these programs and people don't tap into them. You know, I mean, they they've come to the table two or three times asking us for stuff already. You know. So they, they are at the table. They are willing to buy. <coughs> Again, we were working locally. And if we have, then we give. You know, those of you who are bigger branches, and absolutely. You know, there's the hospitals that are ready. Presbyterian is committed, you know, to go as local as they can go. You know, they, they're a statewide. You know, so they, they're, they're willing. I think that the state has stepped up to create the awareness, you know, of going local and the health benefits of going local. So I think we have the people that will make a difference at the table. Anybody else have any comments, any questions? Yes. 
Is GCDC running any help for the food hazardous workshop this year? <coughs> food hazardous workshops have, have handled food safety. Uh, the, the, pro the food processing, the yeah. one that we offer every year? Yeah. Yes, it is coming up in uh, September. September. Is that our first day? Yeah, and if you guys, if you left your email and stuff, you guys will become part of our mailing list and we'll start sending you out information of all the workshops that will be that Thank you. I'm sorry, I have another meeting. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pat. Anybody else? If I can get you guys to please fill this form out before you guys leave, we really need your input on this. And we really pay attention. Anything you write on here, good or bad. Now, some of the colorful questions from these, you know, forms, you know, like Hispanic indigenous or not, are going to come from funds. We get grants, federal grants, and we need to report on the population that we serve. Okay? So we're not looking for anything in particular. We just need to fulfill a need. <laughs> yes, you tell. <laughs> Does anybody have any more questions for our panelists tonight? Thank you. Did you uh, who did you speak to? Was it uh Yeah, I think it was Mr. Yeah, I think it was Mr. Yeah.